Mark, whenever something decent happens in football, a good story, everyone always says, oh, I'll put that one in the book. Um, what made you feel that this was the right time for you to write a book? I suppose really looking at Cyril, Regis, Hugo Ekiog, um, Gerard Samuel, you know, passing away before their time. Um, just thinking that the time was right for my son rather than sit there and try and tell him about my backstory. Write a book and, and let him sit and read it at his leisure one, when he's ready. And when did, you, when did the process start? Oh God, ages ago. Um, I'd, I'd planned to write a book sort of the last season of my career in 1999 when I was at um, Charlton. And um, there was too many diaries came out, so I'd tried to do like a diary thing. Um, so I did, I don't know, 20, 30,000 words. And then I just left it. <clears throat> and then uh, I put something down for myself just on some subjects I'd like to talk about if I wrote a book again. And I started writing some, some on those subjects, some funnies, some things that had happened in my career. And then, um, you know, Kevin Brennan who's, used to work for the South London Press and I used to do a column with him in the, in the South London Press, a weekly column. He approached me and just said, oh, I've been speaking to publishers. They asked if you'd be interested in doing a book. It was like really strange. So I didn't think I could do it justice to write myself. I think, you know, obviously there's a skill in writing. <clears throat> I can do articles and things like that, but a book was a bit too, too much for me. So, yeah, so he, he said he would do it. We sat and had conversations. So you're going back over a year. And we used to FaceTime each other and he'd, give me the subjects in advance, and then we'd sit and talk about those subjects. So sometimes you have to try and find out about things and go back and see what you could remember. The best thing for, for, for myself is we were in, we were in care. <clears throat> so we, my brother and myself went to the social services, this was a couple of years ago, and got our, all our files. And it's really harrowing. Yourselves, if you grow up with your parents, you won't, you know, you just, whatever they tell you, when you were five, you used to do this, this and this. With us, it's all there, it's all logged. It's all, you know, when you went out, what you did, where you went, who you were with. It was, it's really strange reading so far back, all details, and it was handwritten in ink. Really nice. Um, yeah, so the process has been quite long, and then, you know, now it's here. You know, it's, it just seemed, they said, we, we want it for sort of like next, for November. You're thinking, oh my God, it's like a year away. It creeps up on you, and um, yeah. Now it's, it's about to be launched. So all about stuff when you can't, you can't quite remember what happened. Do you speak to other people who were there at the time? Yeah, my brother obviously is a year older <clears throat> and my sister's a year older than my brother. They had quite a good recollection, but it's, it's about what I can remember really. Um, my recollection of <clears throat> some things are quite vivid and then other things are quite sort of scratchy, sort of like my brother say, can't you remember him? He, and I'd say no. Like for instance, there's a girl, um, um, Tracy Cook, and she's, she's living in Australia, she's been in Australia for 30 years. And she sent me an email, uh, sent me a message on, um, on Facebook, just saying, oh my God, Mark, I just seen you doing a book. I hope it goes well, da da da, I'm here, been here, I've got two kids, they're grown up, my husband's passed away, etc." So I haven't spoke to her since we left school. And so other people on, on Facebook and that sort of thing get in touch with you and say good luck with the book and everything. But I had to go back and some things jumped out at me, like in the book I do this, this story about Mr. Arkell, and um, he was the sort of like woodwork or metalwork and geography teacher, something like that. And um, he had a bit of time to kill at the end of one class, and he said, uh, right, go around the room, what are you gonna do when you leave school? What are you gonna do? You're about 16 years of age. And, you know, I'm gonna be a mechanic, so like my dad. Oh, good boy, yeah, I'm a hairdresser like my mum. Yeah, well done. Bright, sir, what are you gonna do when you leave school? Footballer, sir. Everyone started laughing. So you can imagine he was saying, Bright, come on, stop it. What are you going to do? You're going to be a footballer, sir. What's plan B? I don't know, sir. What is plan B? You tell me. What? So he just said, stay behind. He didn't like my cockiness anyway. And then he just said, right, Mark, you've got to think about this. You know, how many people become footballers? How difficult is it? You know, what? I said, no, I'll be all right, sir. I'll be fine. I'll be fine. And then he told me a story about what he wanted to be a doctor. He wasn't clever enough, so he had to be a teacher. And I said, oh, unlucky, sir, never mind. And he just went, you know what, off you go, son. And um, I just, off, just closed the door behind me, didn't think anything else of it. And then obviously, 16, 20, yeah, 10 years later, I'm, I'm in the change rooms at Wembley in the FA Cup final against Man United. And there's all these telegrams, yellow envelopes, stacked by everyone's places. And you just open and go through them, amazing. 
I mean, he wrote to me, just said, I'll be the proudest man in Stoke-on-Trent. Yeah, go and be a winner. So, it's, um, yeah, poignant moments, really. I think I understood, I got it. I got it once I, when, I, when I was there. And they invited me back to the school to do a chat. And I just said, look, I didn't work hard enough. I was, I was a bit lazy. I just, just used to sit there and dream of being a footballer. So if I had my chance to do it all over again, I'd, I'd, I'd work harder. I said, don't make my mistake. And the headmaster said, did I ask you to say that? I said, no, because I did, I regret it. I, just, I used to mess about at school. I just thought, I'll be a footballer, I'll be okay. And I, I realised how lucky I was. So, um, yeah, I always, always kept that, that memory and sort of like hard work and just like, don't let yourself down. It was, you know, there were was, was things instilled in me from foster parents. The, the, the people we were with the longest, Mr. and Mrs. Davis. <clears throat> so yeah, it's, it's a long journey, um, a tough journey, but you know, as I always say, it's worth it in the end. And was it quite, was it quite emotional looking back and, and yeah. remembering stuff? Was it stuff that you, you didn't realise you'd feel emotional about it until yeah. you started talking about it with the author? Yeah, definitely. Um, all comes out. It just, it's really strange. I think um, not, not so much. I don't want anyone to feel sorry for me. I don't want it. Not, it's not. It's not about that. It's just about. Just, just. It's a journey, you know. Everyone's. Everybody's got a backstory. Everybody. It's just a journey, and <clears throat> this is my journey. And I kind of wanted to. You, you, I wanted to sit down with my son and just say, "Look, it wasn't easy for me. You've. I feel like he's been a silver spoon child, you know. Great holidays. Parents have good jobs. You know, wears nice clothes. We have nice cars." lived in a nice house. You know, all those luxuries, all those things that we, I never had as a child. So I just wanted to under, understand how, how privileged and lucky I think he, he feels he is, you know, and his mum and dad are around him all the time. I didn't have a mum and dad. They were, they were there, but then I wasn't with them. I was in care. I was with somebody else, taking up somebody else's responsibility. So it was tough going, looking back and, and reliving the memories, but, you know, it, it sort of like, it shot my focus a little bit to, a, you know, do you want to put this in the book? Is it going to look good? Is it going to look good for my sisters? Is it going to, you know, all those things. And in the end, you just have to tell your story and be honest, you know, and it's, it's, it will upset somebody somewhere along the line, but that's how it was for us. It was quite tough. And do you feel like this book will be not so much a football book? Like it's a bit of a crossover, yeah, isn't it? Are yeah, you it hoping is, to inspire yeah. other people that are in foster care? Yeah, I, th I think that's the thing, you know, Make the impossible possible. I mean, that's what a friend texted me. He said, I've just been reading some of the, the extracts and things like that. I never knew, Mark. I never knew. And it's like somebody in football who I've played against for years and you, you end up sort of like being friends. And he just said, wow, Mark, I've just, just read, you know, the extracts in the paper. And he said, you know, it's an inspiration for other kids in care. You know, the people who <clears throat> maybe are told it, listen, finish school and try and get yourself a job, do something with your life. You know, that, you know, the impossible is possible. Work hard, have a dream, go for it. Whatever you want to do, be the best at it, because the best at whatever they do are the best paid. So if you're the best cameraman, you're working on the best shows. You know, if you're the best interviewer, you have your own, you have your own show. You know, if you're the best driver, you're driving at Formula One. If you're the best mechanic, you're working in Formula One. So whatever you do, the best hairdresser, Nicky Clark, etc. you earn fortune. So try and be the best that you can be. Set your target and don't let anybody tell you can't do it, you can't achieve it kind of held back on doing a Northbrook because I thought there's no real big ending sort of like FA Cup final win picture me there holding the FA Cup final FA Cup or the League Cup or you know something big where you think that's the the journey's culminated in this you know but does does it have to finish it with that isn't 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 the journey part of the success of getting someone achieving something having a dream as a young person that I wanted to be a footballer and be lucky enough to achieve the dream. And, and through what, all what happened, you know, that I come and watch the kids play on Saturday mornings or Sundays sometimes, and you see all the parents down the side cheering them on, and, and you know, I never had that. I never had it, nobody came and cheered me on. My brother was there, that was it. My sister came, my sister used to come in when I was a bit older. That parental guidance, that, you know, the pride, this feeling, you doing something, achieving something, it was all missing. So you have to somehow find the, the spirit and the, the fight to go out and achieve it on your own. And that's the key thing, it, it, right in, it, it'll be, it's in the book of how hard I had to work. I was, I was at a job, getting up and being at work at six o'clock in the morning, finishing at three, going on the bus to get to Port Vale, 
and then working for an hour or so in the gym with John Rudge. And it was hard, it was really hard for me. I was tired all the time, but it was, it was a means to an end. I wanted to be a footballer and nothing was going to stop me. And do you ever talk about, because obviously you're head of under-23 development here, when you're chatting to the younger players, when they're struggling, <laughs> no. do, you, do you ever talk about I your no. upbringing? I, just, I don't. Can, can you think of anything? Hard, isn't it? Be, it'd, be a, it'd be a bit much, you know, sitting there telling, you know, what I had to go through. You know, if they did the um, PLP Premier League Productions, did a, a, a short documentary on me, like 20, 25 minutes. And, you know, in that, you just say everything I said in the book. And, you know, I don't, I don't, don't feel like it's my position to sit and preach to anybody. If somebody wants to read the book and any of the youngsters want to read it and just see how tough it's been for me. You know, it was, was difficult then. And in an era where, you know, there wasn't a lot of people of colour playing football, so you had to work harder because it's, oh, they don't like the cold, they don't like this, they don't like physicality, they don't like tackling. You know, it was all those things. So you had to felt like you had to be better than, you, you know, your, your teammates to, to have a chance. So, you know, it is hard. It is hard. It's hard to be a footballer full stop. Never mind, you know, being a, a little black clear in, in the 70s and early 80s, trying to get into a team. Obviously, we've, we've seen in the news at the moment a lot about the, the problems with racism you had at the England game, but it's, it's in this country as well. Still. Yeah, yeah. Has it, do you feel like it's come back or do you feel like it's always been there? Well, as I told you, it took, took 10 months or so to write the book. We started off with those subjects, those topics, you know, and we covered racism quite early and then you submit it, you know. And the publishers just got in touch with us not long ago and said, this feels like it's out of date. We're going to have to rewrite that bit because Raheem Sterling, what he did with Phil Foden and the other um, young black kid from, the, the, from Man City when they both bought their mum's houses and one was, you know, how great it is and the other one was blingy, showing off flash because, you know, I hadn't played in the first team. And Raheem Sterling brought that to the fore and just said, you know, look at this, this is wrong, how we're reporting this. And he sort of single-handedly changed perception, didn't he? How, you know, change views and how the papers are write, write things or present things to us and little do they realise it's a racist way that they do it you know if a, if a black guy wears a chain it's blingy if a white one but you know oh he's, he can afford it or you know it's just the comparison so we had to rewrite the, that section on racism I just thought it was better <clears throat> when I did the piece that the players can go out now go out for a warm up and nobody's making monkey chants or throwing bananas at them you know as had happened in our day um, people think you're exaggerating, but you just have to ask anyone who's of the age of our age who was a supporter and a fan. You know, like people like yourselves and that, Chris, you're too young. But um, it did get it did get a lot better. Kick races matter football. You know, the FA did a great job. Everybody did. The authorities, the teams, the the f football clubs, um, the supporters d did great jobs. Got you know, questioned people in the stands if they started shouting. It just said no, we don't want it. You know, reported them got people banned from stadiums, it's all come back again. And I think it's come back mainly because of social media. You know, there's a um, story in the book about how I just got a, a message on Facebook one night, you mahogany, black sea, because your ancestors sleeping with monkeys, that's why there's AIDS. I was like, <sighs> you know, and I saved it, I saved it for a few a couple of years on a Word document. And then Stan Collymo, I think, charged or got the police involved in a kid who racially abused him. And they, he got sentenced, like a three-month sentence or something. And I went and looked for the Word document and I found it. And I found the guy's like, contact detail and I, and I sent him a message. I said, I saved that message you sent to me. What do you think I should do with it? And he deleted his Twitter account straight away. But then I sent him a message on Facebook. I said, I, st I still know where you are. I know, wh I know where you work. This picture of his missus and kids. You know, I'm really sorry, I was drunk. I was <clears throat> and he copied his mate and his mate was giving me some as well. So I had a chance to take it all the way, go to the police and everything like that. And I thought this could ruin his life, could lose his job, might lose his relationship. You know, I didn't feel I wanted to do that. I just wanted to show him that, I won't say I had the power to do it, but just that you can't say those things anymore. You know, you, you've got to be more responsible. So hopefully he never did it again because I, I, I stopped short of going to the police. But on the, the positive points in the book, football-wise, <laughs> <laughs> um, the positive, what did you enjoy chatting about from your football days? Yeah, just, you know, the FA Cup final, first one in 1990. I think, obviously, I was lucky to go to two. I went to um, 19, 
92, 93 with, with Sheffield Wednesday. Um, the first one there was just magical. It's just a magical journey, you know, beating Liverpool in the semi-final, getting to Wembley in the final, all the experiences that you hope you'd experience, you know, experiencing those things, the lead up to the game, the game itself, you know, right coming off the bench, scoring two, almost winning it, and then having to go to a replay, which we lose and let ourselves down and kind of always, always you just think, you know what, if I had a chance to go back and replay that game, this is what I'd do. Um, but it is what it is. It's, um, you know, there's a winner and a loser and it's, it's hard. When in 2016, when we got there and Punch scored, I wasn't, I'm not one of those people who thinks, I don't want another group to do well because they'll take all the accolades away from anything like what we achieved or anything like that. I just, I was desperate for them, desperate for them to, to, to get a winner's medal. And they would then become the team you know, 2016, the FA Cup winners, and they'll come back and do dinners and things, and it, and you know, it'd be great for the club to be their first trophy, and that's the team. And years to come, they'll go. People go, who's that, Grandad? Who's that? And they'll name all the players. I wanted them to experience that, and unfortunately, you know, we couldn't quite pull it off again. There's loads of stuff we had to leave out as well, because you just find there's no room. I don't know. I think I think I, I, when I was writing, I always used to think or speaking, I used to think, when my son's finished that chapter, I wonder what he'll think. You know. You know, I mean, we had a sec there was a section where my brother and me moved to a new area, new foster parents, new school, and on the way home from school, we had to run because we had to go down this path that took us to the lollipop lady to cross the road, and we knew if we got to the lollipop lady, we were safe. And um, my brother said, "Hold my hand and just don't, don't stop, don't look up, put your hand on your head and run." I had to run a gauntlet, people throwing stones and bricks at us because two little black kids and. They were unique in the school. Nobody had seen any black kids before. I could still remember that. I could remember that part of it. I mean, imagine how scarred you must be that you remember that when you're five or six. It's not very far. you just got to run like 50, 60 yards to get to the, to the lollipop lady and then you're safe. I mean, I don't know how long it happened for. It wasn't long. Foster grandma, <clears throat> she heard about it. The lollipop lady told her she came up to school the next day. We just died. We're just like, oh my goodness, everyone's going to think we're telling tales and all that. We, you know, headmaster st stood on the stage, said, you know, things are going on at this school are not acceptable. Everyone knows what I'm talking about. See these two kids here? They've got to be treated the same as everybody else. That stops now what's been happening, and you know what I'm talking about. I mean, imagine that I'm five or six years of age, and I can kind of remember what he said. He never said anything about why. He just flitted round it. And like our foster grandma was sitting there as well. She's thinking, oh no, everyone's gonna, what's gonna happen to us? And kind of stopped, kind of stopped. Sport was a, was a great breaking down barrier sort of thing for me because when people saw how good I was at football and things, everyone wanted, everyone wanted you on their team. So oh, we want him on our team, like, so then you kind of become like the hard guy in the school who's picking the team, you're on my side, no he's on mine, no he's on mine, and people fighting over you. And then you kind of became more acceptable because you're good at something. And so I found that you know, sport, football in particular, broke down barriers for me. But in, in sport, at, at school, I was good at everything. You know, the teacher would say, you know, I'm on my um, report, uh, it's, it said at five or six years of age, this is in the, um, the social services logs, it said a budding athlete if I've ever seen one. And my brother saw that and he phoned me, said, have you seen what, what it says on this page, blah, 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 blah. And I, and I flipped through it and found it. So obviously you have to show certain tendencies at a young age for somebody at that early age at five or six saying a budding athlete. Do you have a special bond with your brother then? Because yeah, I guess you didn't. So you didn't grow up in a black family, did you? No, you white, white, white family, white working class. So yeah. it was just you and your brother. Yeah, my three sisters stayed with our mom. Our mum and dad split up when they were young. There's just there's one story where our mum says, "Right, I've got to go to a wedding. Can you have the kids? And I'll come and get them Sunday." So our dad says, "Yeah." So he has us. She doesn't come Sunday, so he walks us over to where she used to live, and there's a note on the door said, I, I, I'm done, it's your turn, you've got to look after him, I'm, I'm, I'm off. I mean, <laughs> who does that? I mean, it was, I mean, when I read it, it was just, just desperate. I mean, what do you do? 
So they took us off him and took us off our, our dad and put us in care. Obviously, he can't. He's working and can't do anything. And then our mum took Marie, our oldest sister, back. So she stayed with our mum and my brother and me went in care. Went out to our maternal gran. She had us first, not for long, though. She couldn't cope. Back into care, then out to the second gran. Stayed there for five, five years. And then we didn't really go back into care. We kind of went from there to, to the next foster parents. Um, I, th I, when, I suppose when I look back at it, I think I learned how not to be a a bad dad you know I think that was the, the lesson I, I thought if, if I have kids and I kind of I, I feel like I probably will have kids I know exactly I'll smother them you know with love and that so when's he going to read the book I sent a copy to him I hope that you, people just read it and just say Do you know what I've got an idea of you know it's not always been easy but like I said it's been worth it